Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this evening's event. A very warm welcome to you if this is your first visit to SOAS. Um, I am Carol Tan, Professor of Law and Head of the School of Law. I am, by virtue of my own research interests, a member of the SOAS China Institute, one of the hosts of tonight's event, the other host being the SOAS Center of African Studies, Center for African Studies. This kind of collaboration between two research centers and the staff, obviously, between, uh, of the two centers is quite typical of the cross-disciplinary and cross-regional study of the world that goes on at SOAS, as many of you who are students here already know. This evening's event is a book discussion of a recently published collection of essays addressing the topic of China, Africa, and economic transformation, as you can see on the screen. Copies are available. I can say this without embarrassment because I didn't write the book. Copies of the book are available at a discounted price, I believe, outside. Um, the editors of the volume are Dr. Akabai, Akaba Okbai and Professor Justin Lin. Now, Dr. Akabai is our key speaker tonight, and he and the rest of the panel of distinguished speakers will be introduced by my colleague, Professor Stephen Chan. Stephen is Professor of World Politics at SOAS, and his long list of publications um, comprise works mainly focusing on the continent of Africa with a special interest on Southern Africa. He has written about diplomacy, foreign policy, electoral systems, elections, internationalization, uh, etc. So he is a most suitable person, I should say, to chair the rest of this evening. And I shall indeed um, hand over the microphone to him. Well, Excellencies, your distinguished guests and good colleagues and friends, you're very, very welcome. We're going to begin a full and I hope very interesting program for you this evening by asking the publisher of tonight's book, Mr. Adam Swallow, to say a few words about what it's like to publish a book as deeply complex and as interesting and as important as tonight's feature book. So, Adam. It's not about me, so I'll sit here quietly in the corner like a good book publisher and see what everyone else, what ideas they have to come up with. Because a book launch, a book event, everyone seems to focus on the book, the artifact, the thing in front of you. And that's really the icing on the cake. That's really a, a transitory stage in the life of this as a project. This is a project with a two-year, 18-month history culminating in printed, printed words on a page and on screen and online and available on an e-book reader from your favorite distributor. And it's that process that I'd just like to take a moment to reflect on from a, a research perspective and a publishing perspective. Uh, Archibald is, is not a stranger to me. He, he published a rather famous little book called Made in Africa, Industrial Policy in Ethiopia, which I believe has some sort of uh, resonance with this institution here, with SOAS. So coming home, it was a pleasure to publish that book, but it was also an eye-opener to working with someone in public life with an academic interest and zeal, um, and to be able to combine these. And part of this combination is the, the process of networking and teams and what we bring. And so an edited volume, which uh, some of you may know is not to be undertaken lightly, um, is, is quite a commitment. It's the oversight. It's the combination. And I'll admit this isn't the only book that Archibald has edited, uh, which has been published with OUP in the last couple of years as well. Because the idea of building a network and building a team of researchers, bringing them together, discussing and sharing ideas at draft stage, 
going away with quite strict deadlines. I love people who deliver on time, but never mind. With quite strict deadlines. And then to be able to not only present it in a way which shows the thought and the work that goes into it, but to add an introduction to it that attempts to sum up what the original plan was and how everyone delivered and where the gaps are and where the future research ought to go from. Being part of that process and being part of some of those conversations, listening in quietly at the side, chipping in where appropriate about what the readers might take away from this has been an absolute delight. So I'm not going to steal any thunder as towards the content because I'm merely a warm-up act. But it's not just about the book. It's about the research that went into it. It's about an event like this where you get to hear the ideas, read some of the content in whichever medium or platform is most comfortable for you, and then to take from it and to continue that work and collaboration going forward. That's the nature of the research, and I'd hope in due course, I get the opportunity to publish some more from people in this room. Thank you very much indeed. It's not often, ladies and gentlemen, that you get a publisher's endorsement of that sort, especially from Oxford University Press. So I thank Adam very much for that. Ladies and gentlemen, I myself have been working on China and Africa relations for most of the 2000s. And I know that some of our guests, like Professor Fatu Cheru, has also been involved in the same research and the same publication on a topic which is very easily sensationalized, and particularly in the United States it is sensationalized. And so the need for sober, reflective, and expert opinion knowledge and judgment on this issue is absolutely essential for the future development of two continents. Uh, tonight's book is an extremely distinguished contribution to the debate on China and Africa. One of the two co-editors, Dr. Justin Liu, I had the pleasure of debating him at the University of Lund in Sweden, and it became very, very clear to me that I'd better raise my game because Justin spoke first. And it was absolutely crystal clear within the first 90 seconds that he was a technocratic thinker of the very first order. Formerly chief economist at the World Bank, now a very, very distinguished academic figure in China itself, combining the highest levels of practitioner knowledge and skill with the highest level of academic research and contemplation. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that combination is very, very rare, but it's epitomized tonight, personified, in fact, by the second editor of tonight's book about China, Africa, economic transformation, and that's Dr. Akebi Okube. He has a special relationship with Soaz. It continues. His wife is here. Uh, Akebe himself took his PhD here at this institution, so we regard him as one of our own. He is a senior minister and special advisor in the office of the Prime Minister of Ethiopia, a reforming Prime Minister who recently won the Nobel Peace Prize. So he epitomizes a new generation in Ethiopia and in Africa that is technocratic, progressive, and wants to go ahead on a planned but still very, very bold basis. Akebi epitomized his boldness and his managerial skills when he was mayor of Addis Ababa, a city that's grown phenomenally. Underneath his mayoralty, it grew in an organized and absolutely planned way. It might seem like a chaotic expansion. The thought that went into making that manageable owes a very great deal to Nanite's speaker, and he was voted best African mayor in 2006. I was on the short list of the best mayor in the world in the same era. He has been given a very great deal of recognition in Japan, where he has been awarded the Order of the Rising Sun, Gold and Silver Star, and is associated with the United Nations Wider Institute and with various research institutes around the world. Uh, I count seven books that he's published with Oxford University Press. Maybe I'm missing one or two. 
But actually, I don't know any academic here at Oxford who's published that many books with Oxford University Press. So perhaps we could persuade him to perhaps put his name forward to be the new director of SOAS, and he could come here and set up shop on a permanent basis. I know he has many friends here who would welcome somebody with his very, very wide spectrum of planning skills to try to run this institution. He was very much recognized by New African magazine as one of the 100 most influential Africans of 2016, calling him a leading figure on Africa's strategic development. So it's very rare we have someone, as I said, who combines the very, very best of both practitioner and academic skills to address us tonight, particularly on such a contentious topic. He comes to speak to us from the hot seat, because of course, Ethiopia, Addis Ababa are key sites of Chinese interest and Chinese investment. How did he handle them? What does he think about all of this? Is there a very, very positive way of viewing all of these things? How can the Africans face the Chinese on equal terms? Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you tonight's speaker, Dr. Akebi Okube. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, this is, uh, this hall is uh, for me very familiar and uh, because of course PED was given here and uh, here there are many friends uh, who have made my life as well as quite uh, enjoyable. I have uh, his Chris, uh, uh, my supervisor uh, and also Carlos was a member of the research committee, and uh, many more. And here also we have friends uh, like Fan Tucheru, uh, who has also contributed a lot to on China Africa studies, and uh, he has been an important uh, uh, advisor to this uh, volume. I would like to thank uh, Professor Stephen because he was one of the scholars who reviewed the book and wrote uh, endorsements on the book. And uh, many thanks uh, for the opening remark, uh, Carol. Uh, SOAS is a nice uh, place to stay and it's like a family. Uh, I should also thank uh, Angelica who is hiding here, uh, uh, answering the, uh, this event and uh, she was able to uh, bring both institutes uh, to organize this, uh, this event. And uh, it's not only me that uh, had studied at SOAS. My wife studied uh, her master's course here at SOAS, and uh, she's a PhD candidate, Negusti is here. Uh, so it's, uh, SOAS for us is like a family. So uh, good evening. Uh, today I'll be talking on China, Africa, and an economic transformation. Uh, we are discussing about China, Africa, but the central concept is the link with, uh, with uh, the economic transformation of uh, uh, Africa. In 1971, Mao Zedong uh, said, our uh, African brothers brought us to the United Nations, and uh, this was for the reason that uh, among the 76 countries that supported China to be a member of the United Nations, 35 countries were from Africa. This is uh, 50 years back. And uh, China, Africa has now emerged as the largest South-South uh, cooperation. FOCAC, which is considered as a platform between China and Africa, is now a key dominant uh, partnership uh, platform. So the first point uh, that we need to explore is, uh, next slide. Is China new to Africa? As uh, I referred to 1971, Mao Zedong's uh, court, it shows that it's not a new phenomenon. It's not about post-2000, and history goes back. And the first uh, 
such initiative where China and African countries came together was the Bandung Conference in 1955, and 20 countries from Asia and Africa were present during this conference. They were discussing how to <clears throat> improve the role of uh, Asia and Africa during the Cold War, how economic development could be uh, promoted, and also how colonialism could end in Africa and Asia. So it has a long history. In 1960s, the first financial assistance or loan was given to an African country, Guinea. $25 million was given for a tea plantation and tobacco and cigarette factory, and the Guineans uh, used it uh, effectively. 1964, the first textile factory was financed from China, and 1970s, early Tazara, 2,000 kilometers of railway was uh, built with uh, finance from, from China. So long history, and it shows that uh, the China-Africa uh, narrative is not a new uh, issue, or a new geopolitical agenda. There are two narratives uh, related with uh, uh, the China-Africa ties. And the two narratives could be differentiated uh, based on, to the extent they rely on the evidence, as well as uh, whether they put African interests at the core, and also the optimism reflected within these narratives. One narrative is the Eurocentric uh, narrative, which uh, tries to portray the China-Africa relationship as a new way of colonialism. This is uh, quite dominant in the mainstream uh, media and also some scholars. Our alternative view, which is reflected in this volume, is a positive view that uh, shows that collaboration between China and Africa doesn't mean and does not have negative implication and can play a positive role in the progress of this uh, continent, and it tries to see with a lens uh, based on critical evidence. One of the scholars that have been uh, doing studies based on evidence is Professor Deborah uh, Brotigan at the Hopkins University. Actually, this volume has been dedicated to her because for more than 30 years, uh, Deborah has been studying China, Africa. One specific example is the land grab. Some seven, eight years back, land grab was a very popular issue. And the land grab, everyone was consultants, researchers were saying there is a big uh, wave of land grab in Africa, and it was linked with, with Chinese. And Ethiopia was an example. And an interesting thing is that in Ethiopia, there was no such an issue of land grab, and the Chinese were not even in agriculture sector completely. So factors gradually showed that the land grab was uh, simply a creation, uh, at least that does not apply to, to Ethiopia's context. So there are two narratives, and the narrative we want to share is how to link the China-Africa ties with the Africa's economic development. So China is now among the four largest investors uh, in the continent, uh, together with France, UK, United States. But it's also the largest uh, trading partner. In year, 20, in year 2000, uh, the trade volume was 10 billion. In 2014, the peak of the trade uh, volume, it reached 220 billion, uh, which is 21 times uh, of the trade volume uh, in uh, uh, 14 years uh, back in year 2000. In terms of finance, about 130 billion US dollars has been accessed by African countries, and about 50% is in energy and uh, connectivity. In terms of human capital, there is no compiled data, but many Africans are studying <coughs> in China through scholarships. Actually, the new trend is now many Africans are going to China, uh, paying their own fee, their own tuition fee, uh, to study in China. Actually, it's not a trend specific to uh, Africa. A day uh, before 
uh, two days back, I was at LSE workshop, and uh, one of the studies presented shows that uh, one of the largest wave of scholarships from India is in China. Many Indian students are studying in, in China. So uh, in terms of human capital, we see some uh, dynamics as well. But in totality, despite this progress, we see unevenness in this uh, economic ties. When we say unevenness, it means that uh, it's mainly few countries who are benefiting from this uh, cooperation, maybe a dozen countries. And these countries who are benefiting are trying to maximize the benefits because they have strategic approach to the China-Africa ties. But there are also, again, imbalances in this economic tie. If you look at trade, the import from China is bigger uh, and the growth rate is quite faster than the export from Africa to China. Uh, it's mainly machineries, value-added products coming from China, but from Africa it's mainly primary commodities. So this will, is going to restrict the trade volume, the composition of trade in the long term. This trade is not going to be sustainable. Uh, if we refer to financing and debt, since African countries are not generating sufficient exports, it's becoming difficult to repay on time, and the size of uh, financing is also being constrained. These are imbalances and unevenness that we need to see and uh, find uh, options on how these uh, risk constraints could be improved. Uh, next uh, slide. Yeah, these are some historical evidence. Uh, Nirere and uh, Mao Zedong, this is 1965. Emperor Haile Selassie, 1971. This is a funny uh, friendship. Our emperor was absolute monarch and Mao Zedong was a communist, and a very tall emperor, and a very, I mean, a very short uh, emperor, and then you could see uh, uh, Mao Zedong taller. Maybe this photograph might have been adjusted because Mao Zedong is quite tall. And uh, Chou Enlai uh, visited 10 African countries in 1964. OEU, or Organization for Africa Unity, was established in 1963. And uh, in 1964, January, Cho and Lai visited 10 countries, including uh, Ethiopia. Uh, this is a Bandung conference. Next. Yeah, so I highlighted the China-Africa, the broader picture. But we have to dive in to see some specific examples. And Ethiopia presents us as a good example. And the reason is, it's a typical sub-Saharan low-income country. And uh, Ethiopia is, in a way, uh, also portrays the inspiration of African countries. The economy has been growing double digit, 10.5% for 15 years. And before that, 5.5% for about 10 years. So it's the fastest growing economy, but this is a very uh, poor, low income country. And it's a country experimenting with new ideas in industrialization. And uh, it has not been considered as a very good student of uh, Washington consensus. Ethiopia has been following homegrown uh, policies uh, for the last uh, two, three decades. Uh, so this could help us to understand the China-Africa ties because Ethiopia does not have cobalt, copper, or petroleum, or resources that Chinese are charged that they are coming to Africa to, to take resources. Uh, so the Ethiopia's uh, strategic collaboration with China has fit in with Ethiopia's uh, rapid economic growth and initiatives related with industrialization. FDI growth has been quite fast since uh, year 2011, and between 2012 and 2017, FDI inflow increased uh, by fourfold, primarily in manufacturing. We could see the next slide. Yeah, the rapid economic growth could be observed from here. This is not data of the Ethiopian government. This is uh, data from the World Bank. So the red line is the uh, Ethiopia's uh, economic growth. And then we see Nigeria. Nigeria is important because it's the largest economy in Africa. And then we see Sub-Saharan Africa average. And then the yellow one, uh, world average growth. 
if we see the next chart, we could see how FDI has been growing quite fast. We are raising FDI because it's primarily productive investment. And the blue line is the most interesting thing. Between 2012 and 2017, there has been a fourfold growth. And the blue one is manufacturing FDI. And 2017, manufacturing FDI reached 89%. Uh, so China has been an important player in this process. For instance, in terms of investment, from the total 5,400 FDI registered uh, investment certificates, 1,350 or close 20% is from China. And this is mainly in manufacturing. The McKinsey study conducted in 2017 uh, shows that there, are, there were about 10,000 firms in Africa from China. And on average, only 30% were in manufacturing. While in Ethiopia's case, according to McKinsey's study, 67% of Chinese companies in Ethiopia were in manufacturing. This was an outcome uh, linked with the government's policy to aim and target China as a source of manufacturing investment. Why? China is a manufacturing powerhouse. 27% of global manufacturing is based in, in China. Uh, so it has been feeding the FDI uh, sources. In terms of financing, Ethiopia has received about uh, 12 billion US dollars uh, loans, commercial and concessional loans for infrastructure. And the infrastructure investment uh, have, has three characteristics. It's linked with industrialization, it's linked with export, developing export corridor, and almost all the uh, such investment are mainly uh, sustainable or uh, green uh, uh, energy sources, for instance. Human capital has been part of this process, but uh, the data is not compiled to show the, the trend. Trade, China is the largest trading partner like the continent. So if we look uh, to the next pictures, this is the Addis Ababa Djibouti railway line. This is a new railway line uh, that has a speed of 120 kilometers. It used to take three days, now it takes nine to 10 hours uh, through this new transportation system. What makes this different is this is not diesel run or thermal uh, power run, it's uh, electric powered used by uh, the renewable energy Ethiopia primarily relies. 98% of Ethiopia's energy is in uh, solar, wind, and hydropower, or in brief, uh, renewable energy. Let's go to the next chart, next photo. Yeah, this is uh, Adama uh, uh, wind farm, uh, and uh, there has been two projects implemented uh, in, in Adama. Next. Yeah, this is among the factories that has been invested, and uh, manufacturing has been core central uh, in Ethiopia's uh, initiative, especially targeted to, uh, to China. The investment targeting is not just focusing on China, by the way. It uh, differs sector by sector. If it's floriculture, the main targeted uh, origin of FDI is especially uh, Netherlands or Holland. If it's apparel and textile, it includes India, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Hong Kong. Uh, and within China, the targeting goes even at province level. China has 34 provinces. If it's apparel and textile, it mainly focuses on four or five provinces where apparel sector is uh, uh, quite, uh, has significant uh, presence. Next. Uh, this is uh, one of the industrial parks. Ethiopia has been building a new generation of industrial parks. Uh, these are not, the parks are not fin funded or financed by Chinese government. They are entirely financed by Ethiopian government. But Chinese consultants and contractors have been involved. But the study on industrial hubs and special economic zones has also significantly benefited from 
learning from China. Next. It's, this is a very interesting thing. Ethiopian Airlines, uh, its first flight to China was 1973, after the visit of Emperor in 1971. And it has then stopped and uh, flights started before seven or eight years. And the first, during the first year, about 50,000 uh, travelers were using Ethiopian Airlines. In 2018, it has exceeded one million travelers. And Ethiopian Airlines flies 250 flights per month. It flies to Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, Hong Kong, Chengdu, Chongqing, and also Shenzhen coming. This really shows an important aspect. This is a service export. And Ethiopian Airlines has been able to tap this opportunity. China can be partly a market. And this is one, one typical example of the strategic approach in relation to the relationship with China. Next. Yeah. Uh, so the first point I was trying to highlight was the China-Africa ties has played an important role, has been a catalyst in Africa's economic transformation. However, there is unevenness and imbalance, and Ethiopia presents a strategic approach in the China-Africa ties. Uh, the second thing I would like to highlight is uh, if Africa has to partner with China or to develop ties and cooperations, it's important to see the role of China in this global economy. And uh, China is an ascending economic power. And here we have to be sober. The trade war is not our agenda. It could be about the first and the second biggest economies. Uh, but we primarily see from the lens of Africa how we benefit from, from this uh, 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 dynamics. So the rising economic power is by itself a challenge, but it also offers opportunity for this continent. Uh, the first thing we need to see is this is a rare economic miracle. We are using miracle as a term to show that uh, uh, the phenomena has been quite extraordinary. So within 40 years, China's economic uh, growth has been on average annually 9.5%. And GDP per capita increased from $156 to $10,000 in year 2019. Uh, and, and this is quite, quite amazing progress. Uh, and Export has been growing uh, at a rate close to 15% for the last 40 years. China has pursued export-led industrialization and have been able to, to insert into global value chain and to attract FDI in a way that it promotes uh, its uh, manufacturing capability and as well as its export capacity. So uh, this is a very interesting uh, element where, Cha where Africa could learn as a source of inspiration. 70% of, uh, of the global poverty was elevated because of China. China elevated 700 million uh, people living under poverty line and which accounts 70% of the uh, global uh, poverty uh, range. Second element is the, it's a rising global economic power. 30% of the growth dynamics is being generated by China currently. 30%. And 16% of global GDP is accounted by China. And uh, in terms of uh, uh, the trend, according to World Bank, IMF, and all other OECD forecasts by 2030, China will have the largest economy. And China will also be a high income uh, economy. Innovation is a major challenge for China. It's rebalancing its economy. But uh, the investment in research and development is uh, growing quite fast. 
in 2019, China spent 450 billion US dollars on R&D. America's uh, investment or resource that was channeled to R&D was in total 480 billion. So 85% uh, has been, uh, we could see the, uh, the, the resource allocated to innovation is increasing. Uh, and currently it's a level of uh, investment in R&D is equivalent to OECD countries. However, this is not to say that China's economy is on par with the US. In terms of GDP per capita, China has a long way to go because uh, when we look at the per capita GDP, it's, uh, the difference the gap is quite significant. But its global presence, because of the scale it has, gives China a significant advantage. The central issue, China has been able to write its own script. It has been able to design its own development strategy to experiment and to charge its own uh, paths of development. And this is an important lesson for our continent. China effect and uh, Chinese uh, resources and China in general as a global public good could be observed in many aspects. Road and built uh, uh, initiative, the market opportunity, and one, one uh, issue coming back to the tourism uh, is important mentioning here. Chinese international tourists in year 2017-19 reached 150 million and they spent 300 billion globally. Africa currently is only tapping 1%. But this shows us as China becomes more, the income level increases, it uh, also creates an opportunity for market. The next slide. Yeah, so catalyzing the China-Africa ties uh, for Africa's economic development is the central issue. Uh, structural transformation is an agenda in many African countries. And uh, after the end of resource boom in 2014, many African countries are considering that sustaining rapid economic growth without structural transformation is almost impossible or difficult, and, and they need to diversify their economy. The other element we need to consider is it's not only China that needs Africa. It's absolutely important African countries recognize that we need China quite uh, equally uh, like the Chinese need, need, need Africa. This is important because if African governments consider that Africa will need China, they will design strategy. They will show bigger commitment to ensure that uh, we attract more investment from China. We use China as, as a, a targeted market and also we can tap resources from, from China. So in brief, Africa needs China. Africa also needs the East at the West. Africa needs the South at the North. And it also needs new partners equally as traditional uh, partners like Europe. As a central issue, whether China's ties serves as a catalyst will greatly depend on the African agency, whether African countries will have a strategic approach, whether they will be uh, applying a proactive approach. Currently, that's not what we observe. Africa Union is not taking, uh, spearheading these ties at uh, regional blocks level or at national level. Um, African countries need to, they have a lot of homework to ensure these ties is beneficial to this continent. Uh, one additional element we need to highlight is China as a source of learning. Uh, China can uh, be a source of learning, especially in industrialization, but also in terms of uh, policy making. One of the uh, positive experiences in China is the pragmatic approach to policy making, not ideological. What works is an important policy that's pursued and the Chinese use experiment and piloting 
And this could be an important approach that uh, Africans can learn from this process. Next. Yeah, so uh, the critical uh, issue here is China-Africa ties is uh, important for this continent and African countries need to have uh, a proactive and strategic approach and uh, learning also will be critical as, as significant as resources or uh, investment. Next. Yeah, the last uh, slide is mainly shows uh, uh, books that has been published. The central issue here is Africa's economic transformation. Made in Africa is essentially about uh, uh, industrial policy and economic transformation in this continent. The Oxford Handbook of the Ethiopian Economy, which was co-edited with uh, Chris and uh, Fantu, the central concept is economic transformation of Ethiopian economy, but it also tries to link with, with this continent. The China-Africa volume essentially focuses on economic transformation. This is one of the handbooks uh, <clears throat> which will be released after a few months and it focuses on uh, global research on industrial hubs, on special economic zones, and Chinese experience also is included here. About 10 chapters, uh, about five chapters are on China. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Akebe, for that very, very interesting and I think challenging uh, presentation, uh, putting a very, very positive view on how African countries can develop their relationships with China, very much contrary to the received Western version of the African countries merely as victims. So with that important corrective in mind, I'm going to introduce this evening's second speaker, uh, Mike marvelous colleague here at SOAS, Professor Carlos Oya. Carlos has been, let us say, a very, very welcome fixture here at SOAS for quite some time. When I was the dean here, he made my life quite bearable on certain days and totally unbearable on <laughs> other days. But someone who was a, always a stimulus in the corridors and his own recent work on China in Africa has been absolutely a revelation to me. Deeply detailed, deeply researched, saying things that are possible only by virtue of this very, very deep research. And so, some words please from Professor Carlos Oya. Thank you. Okay, I have a number of remarks uh, um, on the process of the book and also on, on the topic in general, but um, I think this is a special occasion for me as well because Archibald is here, um, and 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 it's it's a special book. But also, I mean, I've been in these corridors for 25 years. I was a student here as well, so yeah, I am definitely a kind of almost permanent fixture of this place. Um, and and just before I say a few things about the actual substance of of uh, my own contribution to the book in, in in relation to the substance of the book in general um, a couple of remarks on process and and, and how this book was uh, um, the, the final output was achieved and Adam has already said um, a few relevant things on this on this issue but I think just in my own experience compared to other edited collections uh, um, which I've participated, I was struck by three things. I mean, one was that um, uh, Arkebe and Justin Lin were, and I, I think it's mainly Arkebe, um, are one of the few individuals, I have to admit, this has been one of the few individuals who has managed to uh, make me uh, stick to tight deadlines. Uh, I'm quite bad at that. Um, so um, that's attributable to him. Um, the second characteristic is the organization of workshops, uh, both before the preparation of chapters, but also for the review of draft chapters, uh, which is quite unique uh, for the process of editing a book, and I, I uh, believe that's been the same process for the other books that have been showcased here before. Uh, and that relates to the third point, which is uh, it's actually quite unusual to have such a strong peer review process 
uh, for an edited volume, for an edited collection. And in fact, as a journal editor, I have to say that the peer review process that most of these chapters uh, went through is pro was probably more demanding than uh, the peer review process that you find in a lot of uh, um, um, well-known academic journals. Um, and I, I think that's, that attests to, to the seriousness with which this, uh, this book was, uh, was designed and also uh, um, prepared. Uh, my, my own contribution uh, to the book <coughs> focused on, on issues of, of labor and um, starting from um, labor relations and, and workplace encounters um, in, in Africa. I come from the African studies uh, perspective and field and I've been working on labor issues in, in different African countries for, for several years. Um, and the, the, this particular chapter um, was written before the final quantitative results of our very large project, uh, which we did in Ethiopia and Angola, um, were released. So we didn't have the final quantitative results of, of large-scale quantitative service, but we did already have a feel of, of the kinds of things that we found in the ground uh, um, through qualitative research, but also we did take stock of all the available evidence uh, through critical appraisal of that evidence, because there is a lot of uh, um, um, evidence that is not particularly convincing or tends to be misleading on some of the issues related to employment dynamics and employment effects of engagement of Chinese actors, but generally here we're talking about Chinese companies, Chinese firms in African countries. So uh, the chapter really is about the, uh, the quantity as well as the quality of jobs and questions around employment creation, skill development, but especially comparative evidence on, on, on jobs. And in the process of <coughs> writing this, but also doing this research, and that relates to a broader content of, of the book. Um, I was struck, again coming from my African studies uh, um, experience, I was struck by two syndromes that uh, affected, deeply affected, particularly media reporting, but also a significant uh, amount of uh, scholarly published research on Africa-China issues. The first syndrome is methodological nationalism. What this means is that we tend to, we, or some people tend to assume intrinsic characteristics that are attached to the national origins of actors. In this case, for example, is the, the flag of the company seems to have a, a significant impact on a number, a number of issues in, 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 in the case of our research on labor outcomes. And I was struck by that because uh, initially I, I, I never believed that. I mean, I'm quite against methodological nationalism of this kind. And I'm against it because it builds a syndrome of determinism, of empirical determinism, uh, that is essentially built on assumptions that are not tested. Assumptions about the intrinsic national characteristics of actors, firms, and so on. Um, this is a historical as well as non-contextual, and, and in that respect, uh, highly problematic. So that is one of the issues that we, we discuss in, in the chapter, but also I think it's, some, it's a common thread that uh, um, um, arises in, throughout the book. There is a caveat to this, which is that doesn't mean that national context doesn't matter. Uh, of course, national context matters, but mainly in relation to host African countries. So in order to understand, for example, labor outcomes, it is far more important to understand the labor market context of individual African countries than the flag of the companies that are investing in these countries. That is the issue. Together with, of course, a whole set of, of, of wide diversity of confounding factors, uh, such as uh, the sector in which these firms operate, uh, the, the, the time that uh, these firms have been uh, in, in the country, the particular relations that they strike with the government, but also with other parts of the private sector, and so on and so forth. Um, and, and this is why the chapter proposes a different kind of analytical framework uh, that looks at labor outcomes and, and, and the configuration of labor regimes um, as a result of a combination of three uh, levels of analysis and factors. One, the national political economy, the national context, and the uh, um, state institutions, labor institutions in the country, and so on, legislation and implementation of the legislation. Secondly, the level of the sector. The sector matters a lot. So if, you, if you're working on labor issues in manufacturing, whether a, whether a company is integrated in a global production network and, and, and supplying to big brands like Zara or H&M matters a lot in terms of how the uh, pressures that come through this 
um, uh, value chains are then passed on to, onto the workers. And uh, the third level, the micro level of raw labor encounters, is, is where the employees and the employers meet. And, and, and here there's all sorts of other factors that come into play. Some of them may be related to corporate culture, which is not necessarily determined by nation or by the origin of, uh, uh, of the firm. And in fact here, uh, and that takes me to the second point, which is the second syndrome, and that's Chinese exceptionalism. Uh, that basically is, is a variant of this methodological nationalism. It assumes specific characteristics, in this case affecting labor regimes and types of firms and capital, uh, um, that are supposed to be unique to uh, China or to Chinese uh, firms. In short, this kind of syndrome uh, consists of essentializing uh, uh, China, which is, as we all know, a massively diverse country where you need to distinguish between different varieties of capital, as Ching Kwan Li has demonstrated, in relation to state-owned enterprises versus private capital. But even when you look at private firms, there's a whole diversity of different kinds of firms. I mean, going back to the example of Ethiopia, you have firms that are translocal, Chinese entrepreneurs who have no business in China whatsoever, or set up the first business in Ethiopia, uh, uh, firms that are integrated in global production networks and important exporters even within China, and, and with presence in other countries as well, and other firms that have business in China but they come to Ethiopia or other African countries to take advantage of the domestic market, so they're not export-oriented. And all this has implications for uh, the kinds of labor relations and, and, and labor outcomes that we, we find, and I guess also for many other issues. And this syndrome of uh, Chinese exceptionalism, which has already been uh, debunked by uh, well-established research, especially on labor relations in China itself, uh, is often manifested in the field of Africa-China uh, um, relations by uh, a very striking lack of comparative evidence. Uh, uh, there is a lot of research, a lot of uh, reporting on this is what the Chinese have done here, the Chinese firms, this and that. Not much about how this compared to local domestic firms, to European, Western firms, the Turkish, Indian firms, and, and so on. Uh, and that is quite striking. Now, the caveat here is that, <clears throat> of course, even though we, we do not uh, accept this notion of Chinese exceptionalism, there are particularities about China's engagement in, in, in African countries that um, are worth noting, and, and some of them have been already um, commented by, by our Kevin in his presentation. Uh, we do see a difference when we compare with others in terms of the contribution to the development of economic infrastructure. I mean, that is a factual uh, issue. Uh, it is demonstrated by uh, where uh, finance is going, what kinds of projects and what, what kinds of infrastructure have been developed, which is also important to compare with the past, you know, what happened to economic infrastructure in the 1980s and 1990s in many African countries. The second particularity is the disproportionate contribution to investment in manufacturing, something that is actually quite new. Now, there are very few countries in Africa that have received any substantial investments into the manufacturing sectors. And, and if you look at back at the 1980s and 1990s, pretty much nothing. And third, as, as Arkebe was pointing out, China is a source of learning. And again, the question is not so much whether there's a Chinese model. I think everyone agrees that there isn't, there isn't such a thing, or at least the, there isn't a model to replicate or to export. But, there's, but China, as well as other countries, Vietnam or Sri Lanka, Indonesia, are certainly sources of learning. And, and, and that is what uh, countries where there is agency in, in, in Africa are trying to, uh, um, to use. Um, but all these contributions, or, or these catalytic roles, as has already been said, are actually manifested quite differently across African countries. There are huge differences between Ethiopia and Angola, for example. We did the research in, in Ethiopia and Angola, and, and, and the differences in context are, are remarkable. So um, I just wanted to end with a general comment about the book, which I think is compared to other contributions to the field of Africa-China uh, uh, engagement, uh, is not yet another general overview of uh, China-Africa relations. It does go further and deeper on, on some of the issues that have been neglected in, in previous contributions, notably uh, questions around structural transformation, structural change, and the importance of diversity and context in, in, in understanding these processes and outcomes. And, and in that sense, I think it does 
uh, provide substantial value added to what we know already in, from previous research. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been asked to say a few words of my own before throwing the floor open to comments and questions. And I want to echo what Carlos just said. This book does add substantially in terms of our technical appreciation of key issues in the China-Africa relationship. I first began going to Ethiopia in the early 1990s after the overthrow of the Stalinist Derg. I was helping to train the new government, the cabinet, the parliamentarians and the high command, many of whom had been rebel fighters and who had never had public administrative experience. And so you can imagine on the first few visits, my thinking, are we going to be able to turn this into a technocratic nation? And one of the very great pleasures of visiting Ethiopia has been to watch its progress in exactly this regard so that they can now exercise agency in their relationships with an economic superpower like China. So that has been a huge pleasure, watching the growth and the exercise of agency that is well-informed, well-researched, mature, and confident in itself. I've been writing, as I said, about China and Africa for quite some years and been to Beijing also several times, including with African trade delegations. And watching the very, very slow learning process in China, too, about how to appreciate African agency has also been a revelation. So let's say there's been a learning curve on both sides, which I think is going to lead to far better and more mature relationships between the two continents. I want to echo what Carlos has said about the book. The contributors are extremely distinguished, including pioneers in the anglophonic literature on China and Africa, people like Deborah Brautigan, to whom the book is uh, dedicated, with whom I also have worked, who's been a huge influence to correct largely American attitudes, which are very, very biased against the relationship between the two continents. But from this country as well, people like Chris Olden, people like Ian Taylor, they're represented. My old friend, Fan Tu Cheru, uh, who's also published his own work on China and Africa, is also in the book. And what is a characteristic of the book is not just the depth of technical detail, it's not only the stringency that's obviously been applied to the contributors along the lines that Carlos described, but the fact that the majority of the contributors come from China or from Africa. In other words, this is not a bunch of Westerners talking to China and Africa about China and Africa. It's African and Chinese scholars and practitioners talking about their own views about the relationship with, which is germane to both continents. In that sense, this book is itself a major contribution to the idea of equality between the two continents and a very great contribution to the idea that actually we don't need too much outside criticism. There's quite enough capacity and ability and willingness to try to create and to criticize ourselves. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to throw the floor open to questions. Uh, when you are speaking, can you do two things for me? Can you wait for the microphone to reach you? And can you please say your name before you start asking your questions? So I'm going to recognize the gentleman first in the front row here, please, in the smart blue suit. You. Uh, my name is Mr. Ainash. Ainash Abdul Karim. So uh, basically my question relates to the model of development in Africa. There is a lot of emphasis on China with its Chinese buildings. But to be honest, uh, studying China and uh, the high cost of uh, high speed uh, modernization in terms of uh, losing, for example, its access to healthcare, which was loaded in the 1970s during the Alma Ata conference in 1979 for uh, its accessibility. Uh, it's primary care, it's primary care sector as well. Uh, why can we not take uh, the example of Cuba or Kerala in India, which put the emphasis instead on population basic needs, especially in healthcare, 
biopharmaceuticals, uh, which Cuba has done very well. They are exporting vaccine, uh, cancer medicines to America, Brazil, and other big countries. So why don't we just focus on the basic needs of Africa, within Africa, which is big market now integrated, uh, instead of focusing on uh, export to other foreign uh, uh, American market and other markets? Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to take a float of three questions at a time. Uh, hang away, please. Uh, the young lady in the red top. So, th thank you. So, um, so my, uh, my question, I'm Han Wei, um, I'm a PhD candidate at SOAS, and so very nice fin finally to meet you here. And my question is somehow related to my own PhD project. And as we know, media also plays a very important role in, uh, in terms of economic development. So, but many Ethiopian journalists or commentators were released from the prison in the past one year. But um, some scholars that have been worried that the media freedom in Ethiopia will not last. And they think Ethiopian journalists, especially journalists from the mainstream media, still have very little room to criticize the government and also the leadership. So within the rising ethnic nationalism in the country, I would, I'm wondering how much willingness does your government have in terms of democratize the media? And what are the challenges? How open and how critical or how much freedom will the Ethiopian media have in the next five or ten years? Thank you. Um, one more question, please, to end this float. Uh, the young lady in the black, yes, indeed. Thank you so much for the panel, Rob Tell, Nijay Paley. Arkebe was in my PhD cohort, so it's a, a fascinating um, to see him in terms of his surge to five books. I mean, come on, Arkebe, you're making us very shamed. Um, so my question is, you alluded to the fact that, um, you know, clearly China has an agenda or a strategic agenda for the continent, but the continent doesn't necessarily have a continental strategic agenda for, 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 for China. And given how varied the relationships are between China and different countries on the continent, what would a strategic agenda look like? Can you give us some concrete examples of what that would look like and what, what it would entail? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the first, uh, yeah, the first uh, comment uh, and uh, partly question is important one. Here, what we are trying to say is not that uh, uh, we need to focus uh, only on China Africa. We are presenting the China Africa ties as one of the uh, bigger South to South cooperation an additional alternative for African countries uh, beyond their traditional partners, Europe or the US. Uh, so India is also part of this uh, arrangement. For instance, India Africa does conduct summits every two to three years. And uh, Turkey, Japan, South Korea, many European uh, uh, Union members also are initiating this element. On the importance of focusing on <coughs> social uh, services, in particular health, is quite important. If I may highlight one important lesson, in a study done by Ethiopian government, Ethiopian Investment Commission, related with pharmaceutical industry, uh, because pharma industry is one of the sectors, priority sectors in Ethiopia, mainly to attract uh, investors uh, who would manufacture drugs in locally. And a new specialized park has been built at Clinto uh, Pharmaceutical Hub in Addis Ababa. And study was conducted on four countries. The South Korea, Singapore. Singapore mainly because of the eco-industrial uh, system they have developed. China and India. And the research shows that in terms of pharma exports, India offers the best example, better than China, in developing the pharma industry. So lessons were uh, taken and extracted. And the new uh, strategy on uh, pharmaceutical manufacturing of Ethiopia, which was endorsed in 2018, highlights that uh, uh, from the 27 billion markets for pharma products in Africa, 
uh, Ethiopia has put a strategy to target 5 billion or close to 25% uh, because of the Ethiopian Airlines uh, logistical network to many African countries. Uh, the continent uses similar drugs like that would be manufactured in Ethiopia, but it also was in recognition that you cannot just develop pharma for domestic consumption. It requires economy of scale, and within this perspective, exporting to other African countries and local for local market has been uh, combined. So I think I, I fully share what you uh, highlighted. In terms of media uh, uh, and, uh, and democratization, I would say Ethiopia does have a limited experience in this respect. We have had uh, an absolute monarch uh, ruling the country, uh, not constitutional monarch, but absolute monarch, and the ruling in 1975. Between 1975 and 1991, we had totalitarian uh, military regime, and since then, 1995, we had a new uh, constitution. So it's uh, the experience is 25 years, and to be uh, fair, let's try to compare with Europe, where uh, I mean democracy in UK has been going on for almost four or five centuries, or beyond that, and many European countries as well, 200, 300 years. And let's look at the two biggest world wars in the 20th century. And let's see where Nazism and fascism were able to arise. It was in this continent, in Europe. Uh, and we also see currently in many countries, including the US and European countries, uh, that uh, practicing democracy is quite a challenging, a work in progress, even countries with longer tradition. So Ethiopian government recognizes the constraints and limitations what uh, is important is whether the progress is forward movement and whether there is some, some progress, but it's going to require a lot of effort. On the uh, strategic approach by African countries, uh, by the way, she was uh, uh, my very best friend <laughs> from Liberia, and uh, we always uh, 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 admire her for uh, her uh, initiative, and uh, she has produced uh, TD uh, video clips, quite popular. And uh, one of the questions when we were doing the PhD study, which I never forgot, was uh, a professor was uh, teaching us ethics, and uh, she asked, how can we PhD students publish our books? And the professor re uh, replied, she said, do you know how many uh, r people read your thesis? So all the students were expecting, you know, big number. And he said, only, she said, only three persons read on average your thesis, your supervisor and the two examiners. Uh, uh, and then uh, she wasn't happy about the answer. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, on the issue related with the strategic approach, the key point is if the specific country does not have a strategy to diversify the economy, to develop uh, dynamic sectors, uh, if it doesn't have industrial policy to industrialize, uh, then it doesn't make, strategic approach doesn't make sense. First, you, you need to have this basis. Uh, the second aspect is to see the potential uh, that China can bring in, and also the challenges, and to uh, best use this uh, to that advantage. There may be some countries who have built stadiums by Chinese finance. Does this make sense? It's arguable. Uh, but using that resource and finance to generate uh, where new foreign exchange earnings can be uh, generated, or where new productive capacity can be generated will ultimately help to repay uh, these loans. So here, Africa Union needs to take initiative uh, to guide this channel. There are summits conducted, the last one was in Beijing, 
And one thing I learned was the Chinese has been uh, using many think tanks to study the China-Africa studies. Many think tanks come to Addis Ababa and talk to me. I have been to Beijing many times and they spend a lot of time to understand uh, uh, ideas, perspectives to be brought to their central committee, central committee of the Communist Party or People's Congress. So they have been doing a systematic uh, research on how to improve. And if we look at the FOCAC 7, uh, the one that was conducted a year back in Beijing, many of the issues that were being raised even by Western media uh, were raised by Chinese leaders. Uh, the limitation with these think tanks and researchers is that mostly they use Chinese uh, researchers. And this is a constraint because they have to use African researchers if they need to see from the lens of Africans. So a lot of think tank, a lot of research need to be uh, conducted. One of the key issues that is highlighted in this book is that more researches need to be done, especially from the African end. Thank you. Uh, yes, the Minister Councillor from the Embassy of China first, please. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Actually, you know, I need to hes hesitate to raise my hand. This is an academic you know, room, and I try to not be diplomatic, neither academic. There are so many PhDs, candidates, uh, uh, PhDs, but I feel I obliged to a few words. Uh, my intervention is more comments than questions. Actually, you know, uh, during your presentation, Mr. Akebe, you know, it's reminded me a lot. I was posed to Zambia, you know, which when you mentioned Tanzara, it's quite a familiar word to me. You know, it's recalled me, it's reminded me, uh, my young memories, young dreams, you know, as a young man, when I traveled by Tanzara, because it's a friendship, it's friendship between China and Africa deep seated in the people's heart. You know, it's really something, you know, people, a man like my, my age, you know, we can understand how deep, you know, the friendship between China and African people. This is one word I must say here is that, you know, the historic relationship between our two continents. And also, uh, our joint efforts, our joint human, or even sacrifice when we try to build our life, when we call new life at that time. So I think that the friendship and also the so-called economic transformation between, you know, I mean, among China and Africa is deeply rooted in the people, in the history. And secondly, you know, Ambassador Tan is a very good friend to me, so you know him quite well. And I was here because he asked me to be here. He told me that he was not opposed to Africa, you know, when he was young. He was like a guy. He took somewhere better places. <laughs> but, you know, he asked me that you must go, to, go back to, to Africa. Then you know what happened, what changed in that continent. That means Africa is a continent, is a place are full of hope. It's a place that, you know, with all dreams, it's so kind of, you know, shared future of mankind, you know. We are building a new world in Africa. So thank you very much, I'm, uh, not Ambassador, Mr. Abaki, and <laughs> thank you for your new, new book, and congratulations for your new books. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, can we have, uh, just across the aisle here, uh, the lady in the yellow uh, top, please? Thank you. Uh, my name is Lilian Moan. I'm a lecturer in emerging markets at Coventry University. I would like to follow up on the question that was asked earlier about the continental strategy. You mentioned uh, a few conferences, yes, but what would it take for African policymakers, African governments, to come together and develop, adopt a common approach, a common position with regard to this issue of China-Africa relations, and also what would it take for us Africans to write our own story? 
uh, to write, you know, these, I mean, your book is, does make a fantastic contribution to discussions, but it is still considered, uh, we could still consider it an exception rather than the norm in terms of what Africans are writing about the way they see the China Africa or Africa China relation. Thank you. Thank you. And the young man in the great top just behind her. Okay, thank you very much. I'm San Diego, uh, postgraduate from LSE. And when we talk about learning from China experiences, it's not only about economics, but also getting involved with the culture and the institution aspects. So my question is, how can you localize the successful experiences from China and how to integrate them into Ethiopia context? Yeah, could you just uh, repeat the question and, and sum can you summarize the question, please? Uh, how can you localize the successful experiences from China and how to integrate them into Ethiopia context? Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, the first... Uh, a question linked with the how Africa could have common response uh, is, I mean, the first uh, issue would be experience sharing among African countries. Policy dialogue is important. And as you uh, mentioned, it's, it's, it's quite uh, uneven among uh, the, the policy-making process in many African countries differs significantly. So the first uh, step to bridge this could be uh, sharing experience among African policymakers. And there has been some efforts in this direction, also supported by Africa Union, UNECA, and also by Ethiopian government. I usually travel to different African countries and discuss with cabinet uh, uh, members uh, on, on experience. Both sides, there is no a perfect experience from one specific country. The learning has to be uh, mutual. Uh, so this is the first uh, aspect. The second one, at continent level, Africa Union needs to think how to support think tanks in Africa that will be making studies on how this uh, economic ties uh, could be enhanced. Actually, not only on China, Africa. Most recently, we heard Russia has also initiated the uh, Russia-Africa Summit. Uh, yeah, so do we need uh, the Russian-African Summit for arms sale, or do we need for uh, productive investment? It's quite important issue. Uh, so we need to encourage, uh, and, and Africa Union should play an important role in, uh, in encouraging uh, think tanks to, to make studies. And governments need to support such think tanks as well. The other issue related with uh, of China's experience is that China's ex experience cannot be copied. Uh, the first thing is there is no Chinese model that we need to be clear. In this book we said, we started, there is no what is called Beijing consensus. Because there has been some claims that there is Washington consensus and there is Beijing consensus. And we said there is no analytical ground to claim there is sort of uh, Beijing uh, consensus. So there is no Chinese model. And the Chinese, if you look at their uh, history for the last 40 years, uh, what they have been able to achieve is an outcome of the learning they have, uh, they have, they have been uh, uh, pursuing uh, throughout these four decades. The 1978 Deng Xiaoping uh, was recognized as uh, a reformer and as a leader. And the key element that uh, Deng Xiaoping tried to do was, uh, he traveled to Singapore, he traveled to Japan. Actually in Japan, he visited Panasonic factory. And when he visited Panasonic factory, he understood China was two generations behind Japan. The Chinese considered 
They are highly industrialized. They are close to Soviet Union, and they are competitive. It was only when the leaders went and so, and they sent many delegations to Europe, to France, to West Germany, uh, to uh, UK, uh, to do studies. What they understood was that they are generation spark. This created a, a passion and inspiration to uh, to uh, catch up. The second aspect I related, uh, I raised the issue of Singapore. Uh, Deng Xiaoping went to Singapore to study how Singapore was able to attract FDI and uh, also industrial parks. Special economic zones is not a creation of China. Many of us assume special economic zones was created by the Chinese model. That's not the case. Actually, there has been special economic zones in Africa before 1978, in Senegal, uh, in West Africa. And, and the Chinese leaders went to Sri Lanka. Uh, they went to uh, Ireland. They went to many places to study. What they studied was export processing zones. And the Chinese were practical, pragmatic. They wanted to implement this reform. But they said, if we, we call it export processing zones, people will assume it. This is a capitalist pass. So they came up with a special word, uh, special economic zones. This is available in the literature uh, on China. Uh, and they started piloting at Shenzhen. They piloted in three, four places. And at the beginning, it was mainly to attract FDI. Uh, but later on, it was primarily specialized in manufacturing sector. And you will find science and technology uh, parks in Shenzhen, in Beijing, which are world class. So Chinese seriously learn it from others. And the way to approach taking lessons from, uh, from China, uh, I can explain to you by specific example in Ethiopia. I have been traveling to China for many, many years. Many policymakers have been traveling to Shenzhen. Uh, so they will tell you Shenzhen was a small village. Now it has turned it to 15 million population and uh, the size of uh, Shenzhen alone, or Guangdu province, is, uh, if we uh, compare it with many advanced economies, maybe it's uh, number six or number seven economy. Uh, but it doesn't tell you much. Ethiopian government, what it did was, when it wanted to use special economic zones as a component with this uh, new industrialization approach, the first thing the Ethiopian government Put was, we don't really know what industrial zones are. We don't know what industrial parks are. We don't know what special economic zones are. There was only one park under construction in year 2010, Eastern Industrial Zone, and they faced many difficulties. So the government decided to study special economic zones. In Africa, we didn't only study China. We studied Nigeria. Nigeria a negative experience of failure. This is Lucky Free Zone, a zone developed by a consortium of Chinese and also Lagos government and the federal government. It took about 10 years to build, but uh, when the park was ready, I had the opportunity to go and research on this park. And in 2014, May, there were 14 companies who have employed who, uh, who, were, who employed that time 211 workers. It was, there was no energy in the park. So what was clear was special economic zones was not part of industrialization strategy of Nigerian government. And we also studied Mauritius. Mauritius not only does have success story, but also negative experience. There is Genfei, industrial park in Mauritius, which is, could not be said as a good success. So we learned from these two countries. And the way we learned was not official visit to go to Lagos or, Ab uh, or Abuja and then visit. No, that wasn't. Even the delegation we sent to Nigeria, government authorities didn't know it. I was there, we went there, studied for one week, 
We talked to all who were in the park. We took lessons. In Mauritius, we studied two weeks. And then in Asia, we studied four countries. We studied Singapore. We studied China. We studied Vietnam and South Korea. The way we studied China is different. If a delegation is going to be led by a minister, has to go to Beijing, he has to be officially invited by a minister in terms of protocol. So from Beijing airport, he will be well received, and then he will be guided to places uh, he will have to visit. So in 2014, we discussed with the Chinese authorities. We said we are not going to follow this way. Uh, so we had, we made a deal. We agreed that uh, as I was leading the delegation, the research team, we agreed I will not be using my diplomatic passport. So I had to use ordinary passports, travel to Hong Kong, then come to Guangdong province, Chongqing, Zhejiang province, Jiangsu, for three weeks. And we had many questions which we don't find in literature. The Chinese uh, experience you wouldn't find is not covered much in English literature. And one of the questions was, the Chinese will tell you they had piloted four cities, four uh, industrial hubs at the beginning, including Shenzhen. What they don't really tell you is, why did Shenzhen succeed, while the other three didn't equally succeed? And this answer is not possible to get it in documents, even through interview, because those who were involved at the early stage are now retired. They are no more available. So we had to find these people in many places and to discuss uh, their experience. So what I want to say is, Copying Chinese experience is not going to work. It requires, learning requires systematic approach. It requires localizing the experience and also not only looking at one specific experience, but also to combine different studies. Any other questions or comments from the audience? Yes, we've got uh, two here, the gentleman here and the gentleman at the back there. Panel, thank you very much for the discussion. Um, Arkebe, um, can I direct this? Uh, Mick Chu, sorry, finance background. Um, can I ask a very direct question? State versus private investment, i.e., is your dream of growth, of, of Africa becoming what it can be, what it should be, is it going to pivot on state involvement or private money? Thank you. And gentlemen, just up there. Okay, th thank you very much for your presentation. But on, on the flip side, there have been some allegations and some perhaps talks in the corridors that whenever there is a Chinese development, they do not respect the environment and they also do not respect the labor laws they build on wetlands. Did you find that in Ethiopia? And the last question, the gentleman here in at the front in, yeah. Hi, this is primarily to Arkebe. My name is Mark Boland. I'm an Africanist in the private sector. So my question is more specifically about Ethiopia. I mean, there has been argued that, while it's clear that, you know, they have switched in the past few years from kind of very the state controlled model to liberalizing, uh, you know, talking about the uh, privatizing or selling part of the telecoms monopoly. Uh, you possible? Could you comment on this? And could this possibly open for uh, a uh, application to join the East African Community, which the DRC has applied for, and I think is quite likely to be accepted? Uh, how do you view that? Thank you very much. On the labor issue and also environment, uh, respecting environment, I think Carlos uh, may also assist me. Uh, but here again, the African agency element becomes critical. The first thing is uh, many of the projects, infrastructure projects in Ethiopia, 
Some the studies were consult done by Chinese consultants, for instance, some of the railway lines, uh, while some road roads and also uh, power stations feasibility studies or studies were done by Western consulting firms. So the critical issue here, and including like, you know, industrial parks, for instance, uh, from the five type of studies conducted, environmental safeguard, social safeguard, is a critical element in the study. So the first thing is, is the process, does the process clearly specify that these are uh, rigor rigorously followed? This is a critical issue. And I'm aware about experiences in like Ghana where there has been uh, issues uh, and complaints raised. So the first thing is uh, in many of these road projects, I didn't find any difference between a Western contractor or European contractor and Chinese contractor or even Japanese contractor in the execution of these projects that uh, will uh, convince people to say that the Chinese are applying uh, a lower level of uh, approach or compliance. Uh, so this is the first point I would like to highlight. On the second issue, the role of the state in the private, uh, there has never been economic growth or economic development, even in UK, where the state is not a critical player, even the US. Most of the R&D and innovations, researches conducted in the U.S. are financed by the U.S. government by, uh, from different budget. NASA is entirely financed by the government. So the critical issue is the state is important and a dynamic private sector is quite important. So the critical issue would be what is the creative interaction between these two parties. And it changes from time to time. And another element that needs to be highlighted is private sector performance is superior to state-owned uh, uh, performance, doesn't hold water. In many, many examples can be brought. If you look at them, apparently the most liberal country is Singapore. Singapore uh, has one of the best uh, conducive investment uh, policies or business climate. It's ranked number one. And multinationals all have their uh, bases in, in Singapore. But Singapore has more government-linked companies than China. The difference is the Singaporean government has put the bar higher. The corporate governance is of high standard. They introduce a system that inefficiency and wastage is not allowed. Air Singapore is government linked, like Ethiopian Airlines. And in Africa, we have seen some state-owned airlines failing, like South African Airways, private airlines failing, like uh, uh, Virgin Nigeria failing, we have also seen uh, state-owned enterprise, Kenan Airways, when it was owned, failing, when it was privatized, failing miserably. So the ownership doesn't tell much. Ethiopian Airlines is 100% state-owned, 100%. And its performance is improving from time to time. First, the competitive environment is quite important. There must be a competition a pressure for competing, for improving efficiency. Second one is, if the government has to build an enterprise, it must be disciplined. For instance, when our prime minister or president uses an aircraft of Ethiopian Airlines because they don't have dedicated aircraft, Ministry of Finance has to settle uh, the bill every month. So it's not the Prime Minister can take aircraft and then uh, go to Paris for shopping. That's not the case. We have such examples in some African countries. So disciplining uh, is important. The government must be disciplined. On the issue of the liberalization, 
uh, to highlight briefly, uh, the government's approach is not uh, driven by ideology. Uh, if we refer at some of the projects in railway, for instance, the, our government, myself, I have been former uh, chairman of the board of Ethiopian Railway Corporation. We have had many discussions with many investment groups encouraging them to build railway line. Private sector was entirely allowed to participate in railways. Telecom was closed, yeah, and it was a monopoly. And the main rationale for the government and the ruling party was not because telecom by its nature should be owned by government. Its rationale was different. The government saw telecom is a cash flow. We have to use this revenue stream to build infrastructure. So most of the railway uh, new lines we have built, including Djibouti Addis, where 30 to 35% is financed locally by the Ethiopian government, it was the capital came from Ethiopia Telecom. It was mainly a pragmatic approach to use the, uh, this uh, profit because it's a cash cow. But while it became a monopoly, the telecom uh, uh, company has become inefficient. So the government has opened that uh, in order to upgrade the technology, the management system, we need to attract uh, foreign companies as well to take uh, a share in this uh, telecom industry through joint venture approaches. So the approaches are quite pragmatic. I can talk more about it uh, sector by sector or enterprise by enterprise, but the key issues is it's not about liberalization, it's not about ideological drive, it's a pragmatic approach. How do we ensure the economy continues to grow faster? And for the government of Ethiopia, which are, where the economy has been growing double digit, 10.5 for 15 years, the biggest nightmare and challenge is, can we sustain this growth rate? Can we diversify the economy? The population is growing by 2 million every single year. Twice the size of Mauritius every year. Can we create 2 million jobs? We have 100,000 university graduates, 70,000 of them engineers and technologists. We are not creating sufficient jobs for them. So this is a big challenge and this requires a dynamic private sector, foreign direct investment, especially the productive FDI, as well as uh, government's uh, active involvement where necessary. Yeah, maybe just add a comment on these allegations on, on labor laws. I think our research basically shows, as I hinted at before, that this methodological nationalism doesn't hold. That in fact, uh, once you do some systematic comparisons across different players within sectors, then you don't really find any systematic differences. And generally, I mean, the sectors that we're looking at, infrastructure building and um, uh, manufacturing, um, yeah, by and large, you know, the, the, the standards are within the existing national labor laws. So I think the key question here goes back to the, to the issue of African agency. What we did find is that there are very big differences between, for example, the Ethiopian government and the Angolan government in terms of how seriously they take labor issues, for example, in relation to the question of uh, localization of the labor force, uh, much higher in, in Ethiopia than in Angola. And the main reason for that is the uh, work visa policy, uh, which is more strictly enforced in, in Ethiopia compared to Angola, and I would suggest, you know, probably Angola similar to other cases. So the, the key issue is, A, what's the nature of the labor, laws, labor legislation in each country, but also how seriously the uh, government takes uh, labor implications for investments or construction, infrastructure construction, uh, um, uh, in, in, in relation to other priorities. You know, there are always other priorities, and that is uh, the critical thing. So legislation as well as the implementation of that legislation. So if, for example, if, if there is a need for a minimum wage, let's say, uh, there, there's a serious question about, you know, where does it apply? Uh, should we uh, implement it in particular places or not? Is there a national minimum wage that actually makes sense for all sorts of firms and all sorts of sectors? And these kinds of questions, unfortunately, are not at the heart of uh, policy-making debates in many African countries. So it, it does go back to, to African agency in the, in the end. Yeah, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the organizers have asked me to finish this part of the session now. This doesn't mean that discussion has come to an end because 
They should continue in an informal way over drinks outside. And also, you can buy a Kepi's book. And I'm sure he'd be pleased to talk to you as well as sign his book. Uh, Minister Yang, uh, I also had a diplomatic posting in Zambia when we were both young men. I'm sure that we inadvertently shared a drink at the embassy in those days. So you and the other diplomatic colleagues and everyone else, please, why don't we all have a drink together to celebrate a wonderful evening? Let us applaud the author.